Pay attention, you're fighting me. I'm the one who is going to be your final opponent. What's everyone? Welcome to another special podcast interview of the Battery Show. We have me, Ryan, with my co-host, Mike. What's up, Mike? How you doing, everyone? <laughs> and we have a very special guest today. We have an anime voice legend, the voice yeah. of Roy Foker from Robotech, also from Bleach, and a lot of numerous anime voices. Dan Warren. What's up, Dan? Hey, guys. How you doing? Awesome. How's your how's it there right now uh, at your house? Or your day well the air conditioner works so it's good awesome <laughs> the uh, the weather is making us use it so <laughs> <laughs> definitely um so again dan thank you so much for being our special guest and hope you enjoy this podcast interview uh, already enjoying it thanks yes again special thanks to mike for an awesome intro for dan so yeah thank you, it thank you man thank you I, I appreciated that the trickiest part is the aspect ratio because <laughs> some of those shows were four by three while others are 18, sorry, 16 yeah. by nine. And, you know, you got to make it all like one aspect ratio. Otherwise you get those black bars, you know, I, I hate yeah. those black bars. It's a lot of work and I appreciate yeah. it. Yes, and I'm sure everybody yeah. that saw it appreciated yeah. it too. No, I, I appreciate that you loved it. You know? <laughs> yes. All right. So let's put, let me save this here. All right. Danny, push in the and there you go. Uh oh, yes. Ooh. Now he's a, now he's a man. We have Roy, guys. Now let's put here. Yeah, and... I'm not gonna Damn. die through this interview. I promise. Yeah, don't Thanks worry, guys. No. <clears throat> not gonna yes. happen. So before, so to start this interview up, Dan. So how did you get? Oh, um. Well, my question is, how did you start with voice acting? Like, what made you pursue in this career? Well, honestly, um, in, in college, uh, I was interested in voiceover, I guess, even, I mean, quite honestly, when I was a little kid, we used to do stuff on a, on a reel to reel, me and one of my buddies would, you know, I remember we, we did the announcing for a football game that we made up and made up the characters and made up what was happening on the field and just went into hysterical laughter. I wish to God I could find it because I had this, I'm a little kid, so you had this little kid doing this whole play-by-play uh, play and laughing and cracking up and we just be giggling and it, so I've always enjoyed that ever since I was a kid and and then when I got into college my voice had developed enough so that it, it sounded kind of good and and one of the other students asked me to narrate something for him a, a report that he was doing on uh, uh, Herman Hesse uh, the author and and uh, the, philo the uh, philosopher and um, and so I did that and it went really well. And so I feel, I felt like, well, maybe I can do something with this. And then graduating college, I did, did some children's theater, doing a lot of different stuff with that. And then decided to move up to LA from, uh, from Orange County at that point. Um, and from there, I just encountered a couple people that were really helpful in that. Uh, they just kind of heard my voice. This happened a couple of times. I guess I'm, I'm really very, very lucky for that is they heard my voice and uh, they, uh, excuse me, I got a message coming in that I'm going to go straight to message and uh, there it's done. Okay. <laughs> 
um, <laughs> they um, suggested that I might be good at, at stuff like that. I honestly, it, it was just somebody I, that I encountered that was just starting to direct anime stuff, and, and she became a very close friend of mine, uh, Bird Elman. Bird, she's passed away uh, some, some years back. Uh, but just she was so, so helpful. And, and so that's where um, I, I guess it's, I started doing voiceover for there was a there was a, a clothing store called Miller's Outpost uh, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s into the mid 80s, right before the gap. That was the, 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 the precursor to the gap. And they had co commercials on with a couple guys who were models that were supposed to be talking and they were talking, but they were really bad. It, it was just bad acting, and so they wanted someone to dub uh, one of the guy's voices and somebody to do the other one. So I ended up being asked to do that, and and I did that, and I ended up becoming the spokesman for that for that company on camera for for a few years, and it was an awesome gig. And I think that's where I met the other friend that introduced me to anime, and she said, "I think you'd be good at this. You should come and audition." And so I, that's where I auditioned at the studio Intersound, which was a that's where Robotech was recorded. Um, mm -hmm. And this wasn't initially Robotech, but but because I was there, I got considered for some other things, and that was one of them. So that's that's kind of how I got into it. But again, as I was saying, it was just somebody saying, "I think you'll be good at this," and giving me a chance. And the same thing happened with the audio books that I've been recording for you know over 10, 12 years, or maybe even longer. Um, but that was somebody that I was at a video game audition. I walked outside with her. And um, she's a British actress, really, really talented narrator and actress, uh, Rosalind Landor. And she just turned to me, she said, Dan, you'd be very good at audiobooks. You should do that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And now what do I do? And she introduced me to a couple of people that were major publishers, that worked with major publishing companies. Publishing companies? I thought they needed include <laughs> publishing companies. And... Um, from there, it just it just went. I was hired almost immediately and started working in that realm. But again, for the kindness of, of other people. And so I, anytime I can do something like that for somebody else that I, I hear the quality, I go, yeah, you should be working. I'll do that. I'll, I'll say something if I can and help them if I can. So very lucky guy. Yes. Uh, to continue to, next, to my question, since you um, mentioned Robotech, what was yeah. your process for voicing Ray Falker? And did you expect his Valkyrie Battle to be the flagship mecha over Rick Hunters? You know, with, with Roy, it, it was just kind of seeing seeing the animation and, and sensing, you know, from, from Carl, who was, was directing and, and did the auditions as well, um, sensing that, that he was a hero. That he was, it was a good man, you know. Try, uh, trying to put all of those those quality concepts into into what I was doing with the voice work. I mean, it was well written. Um, it was a great storyline, but to just try to bring the integrity of the character uh, to the forefront and and make him a real person at the same time, not just some kind of uh, automaton in the military or a flight, you know, a fighter pilot or whatever that that doesn't have any any real other characteristic that stands out. That was. That was a goal for me was to try to really bring that sense of humanity and integrity and and someone that you know when when rick calls him big brother that you really felt like there was that connection so as far as any any flagship being the right one for for him to fly or for you know to, to be the uh, the star uh, the star attraction if you will in the skies i i had no clue what was going on honestly um i was just glad to be in the pilot seat and and uh you know, unfortunately, at some point that didn't happen any longer and it was way too soon. But we all know that. I think yeah. hopefully a lot of people agree with me with that. I can't tell you how many guys have come up to me and said, dude, I cried when you died. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. 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 If it wasn't for my diet, I would I would have <laughs> eaten a pineapple salad in your honor. <laughs> like. For real? Like, yeah. like one of one of the alternative one of the two names for that episode is just called pineapple salad and like you you wouldn't understand the context if you haven't actually watched the episode right yeah. um very very true yeah speaking of that episode uh Roy and Claudia's relationship was one of the earliest interracial relationships in animation history uh, I cannot find any sources disputing or confirming whether it's not it's the first, but right. it's I so I'm saying one of the first, you know, because I don't 
remember anything before that. And unlike Pluto's stepchild with uh, William Shatner and Sean the Coles, this was consensual. These and Trotty yeah. wasn't weren't forcing you to do it. So yeah. my thoughts. Is, so my question is, what what are your thoughts on the cultural impact of uh, your relation uh, of Roy's relationship with Claudia, as well as the U.S. <laughs> censorship of their kissing scene until the DVD release? Yeah. Um, well, I, I do. I don't. I think the the easiest way to find out whether it was the first one is that there's this thing called Google. I think it's Google. 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 I try. I I, I try. <laughs> really I'm just being facetious here, but it's just like, so who was the first interracial anime couple? Just to see what it says, I'm curious. But um, yeah, it was it was certainly uh, something that was not not common uh, and unexpected, but it wasn't played for anything other than what it was, which was a loving relationship between two people. So there was no, you know, it, it wasn't like, look, look, we're, we're showing you how to be racially equal or, or whatever. It was just two people, which is the way it should be. Right. It's not yeah. about anything beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Even though the show is from the 1980s, the, uh, the setting is 2009 because the ship crash landed on earth in 1999 right. and the main story takes place 10 years after that. So it's 2009 and yeah, you know, it's like it's nice that our real life 2009 is almost like that. At least, yeah, right. <laughs> it's heading in the right direction. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, heading. Um, yeah, you know, better than Back to the Future Part Two. <laughs> yeah, much, much more so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I just uh, I, I'm delighted. But another thing, it's about the writing of the show too. For the fact that I I've had numerous. Uh, guys and i think at least one woman actually come and tell me that they joined the air force based on the portrayal of that character of roy folker based on as i said like the integrity and and the uh, the heart of the character made them you know want to be in the military because that's what it embodied for them and so that was a huge thing to know that 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 i had that impact on some people's lives um through through my voice and through portraying that character but again just that that uh, the realization and, and the, the proof that the show was was very, very timely and, and, a, and ahead of its time in the way that it depicted things like the relationship between Claudia and Roy, um, the realities of war that people die, including yeah. me. Um, the, the, it, was, it was a very real show in, in that way, and that was uncommon and really hadn't been uh, put out in that manner prior to Robotech, I don't think, and I've had a few people tell me that as well following the show so i was just really grateful that it was so well written and that uh that carl was on top of it uh as far as the the writing and and just the direction and where it was headed and that again it's lasted this long that it has a fan base that continues mm -hmm. is astounding and and just so great to be a part of because we didn't know and especially with me with me disappearing so shortly into the series mm -hmm. It was like, wait, what? What? No, I'm. I'm what? He's mm -hmm. dead. Uh, it was. A, it was a stunning thing for me at the time, because um, I would go home. Quite honestly, it was on at three thirty in the afternoon, I believe, on Channel Eleven, KCET, or Channel Thirteen. Right. I forget which. And I go home and, and check it out and go, look at that on TV. Look at that. Look at that. Hey, wow, wow. Uh, so it was something I was really enjoying very very much and then and it was a short-lived run of enjoyment in that regard yeah you know i you know i discovered robotech through my love of gundam because uh when i was a kid there was a store i really liked that was like all the way like near the beach called puzzle zoo and that's like the only place at the time where you could find gundams mm. and that's where i discovered robotech because there were robotech toys there and of course you know your valkyrie was the cool one that was displayed <laughs> yeah. the most and and I and I noticed there's a lot of similarities between the two shows because both fo uh, both Roy and Ryu in respective shows died to help uh, Rick and uh, Amaro mature as a character. Yeah. yeah, and I and I appreciate like how both shows like elevated you know that maturity and to some extent you know sometimes I, I feel conflicted. It's like. This show's so good. I wish I watched it sooner. But on the other hand, I'm glad I watched it more recently because I now have more emotional, social, and literary maturity to appreciate these themes on my first viewing instead of just, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> like on my second viewing. 
Well, that's awesome. I mean, you have a little yeah. bit of a history, and so you yeah. can you reflect on things that yeah. you might not know the first time right. around. So that's awesome. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for yeah. watching. Of course. <laughs> Uh, continue with uh, with Roy and Claudia's relationship. Um, given how accepted your guys' relationship was in the fictional 2009 society, would you consider them to be a precursor to the human centrality romance between Max and Amelia? Uh, maybe. I don't know if it was the intent necessarily, but uh, who's to say? Um, we are more accepting <laughs> as, we, as we've gotten along in the world. I, I, I don't know that that was an intent uh in in putting it out there but it could certainly be looked at that way uh perhaps perhaps not who knows i'm not sure <laughs> in any case i did cry when i did watch the episode uh where um where max and amelia got married and then you could see roy in the background during the wedding ceremony not the wedding ceremony but during the wedding reception like yeah. after a uh, uh, global speech because it's like, it's like I left behind a uh, a, a positive world, you know, mm. and, and I wish Roy was around to see it happen. <laughs> well, that makes two of us. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? <sighs> Maybe he'll return in some form. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So my so this is a question I actually did ask you uh, during Robo Toy Fest. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your process for doing the voice of Crosswise in Transformers: Robots in Disguise? Well, I know there was some connection with Speed Racer you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I I didn't quite honestly. Um, Crosswise was just kind of uh, presented to me as uh, you know this is a character for you to do and and this is what it looks like and go for it kind of a kind of a thing more than anything else that was kind of the, the procedure on that um and so uh what i did was acceptable they kept it uh it, it wasn't uh a long you know a long run on that character necessarily but it was it was still fun and obviously to be a part of that universe is always a, a nice uh accolade and something that you want to be uh, associated with so there wasn't a, a specific technique to that but what i what i had started to say before about speed racer as far as a vocal technique when you're you're given a character if you have if you have time hopefully you do to take a look at the animation and get a sense of what they look like and any kind of uh, direction or or uh, backstory they give you about the character you you take that with you and so um looking they they did a uh a, a redo or a, a 2.1 or 2.0 of, of Speed Racer uh, and they were auditioning and I, and I auditioned for the role of Pops and, I, and I'd seen it before and I had a kind of an idea but, but I felt like there, there was another actor friend of mine, uh, Bob Pappenbrook, who was uh, Bryce Pappenbrook's dad and mm. Bryce has, has done very, very well in this industry and he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bobby was one of my good friends and just an incredibly talented guy, just the sweetest man and just had this big blustery voice, you know, when he'd walk in the room and he goes, hey, Danny, how you doing? <laughs> you know, that, that was Bob and that was, there was no fake to that or anything. He was a big guy and he, he was mm -hmm. a big personality and it's like, how you doing? What's going on? How you doing, guy? And, uh, and so I started looking at the Speed Racer at, at Pops and said, yeah, I should do, I'm just going to do Bob Pappenbrook for this character. I'm <laughs> going to do Bob because this looks right. And and I got the role doing the voice of Bob, basically, in, in my interpretation of it. And the irony of that is the fact that Bob also auditioned for the show, but I got the role, which is crazy considering I was doing an impression of him. So that was kind of a trip. But yeah, it, it varies from, from character to character, what you, what you want to do with it. Um, as far as if you want to find any any something that's a little odd about the character based on the what they look like or or the in the speech if there's a hesitation or something it can lend you to to something to play with because uh, you don't want to just be static or boring obviously and and you want to also maintain a, or do a voice that you can maintain sometimes we forget when we've got a big character that's that's a a warrior or somebody that that's a bad guy that's going to scream a lot and they're going to be in it quite a bit and you and you start off a little too hot so that you're you're talking back here like this and doing this whole thing and then you realize you have three more days to do this voice and you're going to die <laughs> um because you didn't think 
uh, ahead so much and now you've <laughs> been established with that voice so now you have to do it every time and drink about 28 quarts of water every minute or so to you know put mints in your mouth things to help your throat so that's a danger when you get excited about a character that looks formidable or scary and then you put too much into it and then you have to uh reap the the, uh, the lack of benefit from destroying your voice so yeah i think so you got to be careful and sensible too uh, those, that is actually really good advice for people aspiring to be voice actors because yeah uh because you know like a lot of people they think about the um like just doing voices and impressions but they don't really think too much about like doing performing maintenance on your voice yeah. because that tears away all the time and you know being a roadie i've seen a lot of metal bands just like oh. quit early because because like the screech yeah. vocals just died out too early yeah no, I had um, I had nodes on my vocal cords back in the back. Was it the nineties? Was it the nineties? I don't remember. No, I think it was in the early nineteen nineties. I had a couple of uh, vocal uh, nodes on my throat that that I had to get taken care of, and that was because of the way I was doing things. It was not good for my voice, and and I had a speech therapist that I went to to help me with that, and uh, and it was it was quite a learning lesson, you know, as far as taking care of the voice and especially with doing audio books because we're talking for hours at a time and you don't think if you're talking at a normal rate of speed or a normal projection that it does that much to your voice but you multiply that out by five five or so hours a day and let's say four or five days in a row your voice is a little trashed by the time the weekend arrives and i've even learned in doing the conventions because of the masks we speak louder because we have a mask on and so it's a matter of projecting properly then because the first one of those that I did uh, for uh, Scott Zillner back uh, towards the end of last year, I think, mm -hmm. um, it was a full mask situation and, and I never took it off. And so interacting with everybody through the mask, I, I, again, didn't think it would have any effect on me vocally. And then I hadn't finished a project that I was working on. And that following Monday, the day after the uh, convention was the last day on that. And I woke up and my voice was moderately trashed. And I was like, what the hell? Yeah. Oh, man. So I, I, I have to remind myself now if I'm doing, if I'm doing one of these uh, live gigs on a Sunday and I'm, I'm recording on Monday, I have to be really aware of that because you, you don't know what's happening until it's already happened if you're just talking normally. If you're screaming or yelling, you know pretty quickly. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, like we don't really think uh, too much about how, like, how many sound waves get absorbed by our face masks. And, you know, this is generally why I prefer the medical ones because they allow more of the waves to transmit through the mask. Yeah. Um, you know, compared to, like, say, the fabric ones. But mm -hmm. even then, you know, like, it's masks are mandatory. You know, we have to yeah, adjust it. to it. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I just I just have to, you know, in the future, and I'm aware of this now, and yeah. you know, hopefully I will continue to be, it, that if I've got a gig on, if I've got a convention on Sunday, to try not to have the voiceover, you know, an audio book or something on Monday, because yeah. it, it's tough. So, yes. I live and learn. <laughs> live and learn. Damn it. You got to live hey. and learn. Hey, my God, but we do love your voice, Stan. Now, <laughs> speaking of your voice, you did voice one of the most iconic anime characters well anti heroes of all time which is Bayakia Kuchiki in Bleach. Kuchiki. Kuchiki. I, Kuchiki. Kuchiki. I don't know why. I have like a it's, it's because it doesn't look right when you I know I keep saying Kuchiki. Written, your mind goes no that's I know not. like but Kuchiki. anyways you did voice that amazing character. Mm -hmm. Like what what was it like what's your reaction knowing that your that's this character you voiced decades a decade ago is now one of the most iconic anime characters of all time. I again I I'm so so grateful and didn't know at the time but i i had a hint uh when there i think it was the first uh bleach movie i forget how many there were um but uh i went to a screening like we're hearing four um <laughs> i, I only a, know the, about four of them I, if right. there was a fifth one i wouldn't know <laughs> well i it, it was the first one that i had been to yeah. and and there's a, a scene in there where uh he uh, utilizes the Zanpakuto and, and says uh, scatter, which is, you know, uh, Senbon Sakura, Kagayoshi, scatter. 
And the scatter on the screen is filled with all these cherry blossoms. The screen is filled with them, you know, kind of circling around and then finally coming down and doing their thing. And the crowd burst into applause in the theater and that blew me away. And I was just like, geez, this is awesome. Cause it looks so cool. And the, to have my voice underneath it and triggering it was quite an indication that it was special. And it was just, and, and the crowd reaction was just, I was not prepared for that. I had no idea. I was kind of like, oh, whoa, everybody's clapping. Wow. And they're like cheering. Wow. So that was, that gave me some indication of the power of the show. So I'm just, again, you just never know. I, I'm so glad to be a part of it. And I'm so looking forward to doing more of it in the very near future, but we'll see what happens. I have no guarantees on nothing. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. Ble like for Bleach, Bleach was like the mo like the first adult anime I watched as a kid. Well, it doesn't force, so yeah, I was nine. <laughs> it was pretty much the flagship anime of Adult Swim before Toonami came back. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of memories watching that. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, right now talking to you, like, oh my god, I'm talking one of the bit, an iconic <laughs> character. But yeah, like Bleach has a special place in my heart, my heart. So. <laughs> No, I'm so glad. I know it's still obviously very popular in Japan as well, and that's why it's coming back here. So, yeah, yeah honestly, I, I feel very honored. You know, at, you know, being a part of the Buttery Show, getting to meet both Byakuya and Rukia in mm. semi-consecutive <laughs> weekends. Nah. And then, and then the next semi-consecutive weekend, I get to meet Byakuya again. Yeah. Um. And yeah, and yeah, one of my favorite things about Bleach is how like they always call it, evoke the name of their uh, Zampak Toe and mm -hmm. give it a command because, you know, like uh, I, I'm very photophobic, so I always carry around an umbrella and it has a katana hilt. So yeah. sometimes, you know, just for the fun of it, when I open my umbrella, I say Shroud Kumamaru <laughs> <laughs> when I turn it, when I activate my umbrella. So, but nice. speaking, but. You know, speaking of uh, Byakuya and Rukia, uh, I have we actually have two questions pertaining about the relationship. First one is uh, between the rescue Rukia arc, you know, back in seasons two and three of Bleach, and the Rogue Zanpakuto arc, in, which is season eleven. Uh, what, which of the which of these arcs had the greatest impact on you doing the voice of? Um, of uh Byakuya like like be between being the anti-hero versus the total hero fighting his ancestor well I, I don't want to say it was equal necessarily but again just the opportunity to play something that's a little against character in this case him being an anti-hero uh was 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 so much it, it, it's it's more of a challenge in the sense that as an actor you have to find the the area that that could be tweaked a little bit to to display and and demonstrate that he is not the normal Byakuya that this is something else that's going on here within his mind within his psyche and um just being able to tap into that and and I think I'm it's fair to say that that I don't want to say most but I'm going to do it anyway I think most actors love the opportunity to play a villain because you get to dive into something that you don't necessarily get to do often and you can't really do in real life unless you want to get arrested um so <laughs> it's it's an opportunity to to find if you will the dark side and and be able to to shine a little light on that in the sense of showing you know what that means and especially within the uh, the context of a character that's already been established it's like oh this is another side of him you didn't know existed and so from, from the actor's standpoint, anytime you get to grab a hold of something like that and, and flesh it out and, and uh, you know, especially if it's well written, you just have such an opportunity to, to play. I mean, that's just, uh, as an actor, the opportunity to, to portray a character that isn't you, that isn't necessarily something that you would do as a, as a real person, but that you can tap into and, and be able to project that through your voice that's just wow and obviously on camera uh, but in this case it's it's vocally um it's it's just such a such a rush to be able to pull it off and and to be able to again illuminate more about that character to bring more to it for for the fans to to see oh like wow i never saw that coming but to do it in a manner that that's believable as well 
And I think that's so critical. So I would, I guess I would lean more towards being the, uh, the antithesis or the, the anti-hero than, than the hero. But again, mm, love being a hero. Who doesn't? And, and he's not filled with himself and doing some doing, he's not doing good because uh, he's such a cool guy. He's doing good because that's where his heart is. That's what he believes is right. And, and so that's significant as well that he's not full of himself because he's so cool or such a badass or whatever because it'd be easy when you're that much of a badass it's like look what i can do yeah yeah like you know but you have really good villain voices uh in your uh filmography because because you know you did play one of the villains in a certain fox kids show most people don't even remember called dinosaurs and uh, Dino Drago was actually the, a more engaging villain than the actual main villain. So, you know. <laughs> well, thank you. And he had the coolest toy design out of all, uh, out of the entire toy line. Just saying. <laughs> I just, you need to send me a picture that I haven't seen one in a long time. If you have one. I, I will look for a picture. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be very curious about that. And I actually, uh, on camera, back in the, in the 90s, I don't even know if this is available or whatever. I, I think it appeared on Fox, <laughs> uh, but it was a show called uh, Back to Dinosaur World or something. And it was a father and uh, a husband and his wife and kids going to this dinosaur park and the dinosaurs kind of came alive or something. It was live action shot at this dinosaur park up north. I forget exactly what city was in heading towards San Francisco. Um, and that was that was a crazy thing to be a part of these. They had these big audio animatronic kind of like dinosaurs there um but that was that was kind of a trip <laughs> so i have some connection to dinosaurs and that was on tv i saw it locally going oh damn look at that okay um so so yeah i do i mean i love playing the villains um it's it's quite quite uh, quite a bit of fun um and so any chance i get to do that it looks like i i didn't get the part um because it's been a little too long now since I auditioned for it. But the, the latest James Patterson book, uh, I auditioned for, they're, they're doing three narrators on that. And one of them is, uh, is the killer, is a serial killer. And so I got to read for that. And I was like, I want this. I really want it. <laughs> but I didn't get it, apparently. So it happens. I mean, that's the nature of this business. If you, you have to be able to, for anybody that's thinking about getting into acting, voice act, doesn't matter, acting, period. You have to be able to just let it go. Every audition, you can't cling to it, no matter how much you want it, no matter how much you feel you need it. You just have to be able to go, okay, I've done that. I, for, I forget, I just read this recently, and, and it might have been, um, uh, God, I'm just trying to think what famous actor, uh, for the life of me right this second, I blanked on who it is, but the, he says two things whenever he goes out, uh, whenever he's about to do a take, to himself, he says, who cares? <laughs> who cares? And that way you can release all the tension and the pressure and all the, all the stuff, you know? And that made sense to me. So just from the standpoint of, if you're gonna get into this business, you're gonna be rejected many, 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 many more times than you're going to be accepted, if you will, or given the job. So you have to be able to take that and not take it personally, which is really hard. So that's that's one of the the traps you can fall into in the, in this uh, in a career of of this particular genre of, of being an actor that that you're gonna be rejected. And unless you develop a tough skin and a, and a reality to, to know that it's not all about you, that there's so many myriad different reasons they didn't hire you that you can't even imagine, you kind of look like the guy that used to date his daughter and he hated that guy. And there's no way in the world they're going to cast you. Or, you know, your hair looks stupid. You're not going to get the job. Or it's, any, it's like a billion different reasons that you never even consider. Mm -hmm. So... Bottom line is, if you're going to be an actor, you need to develop a tough skin. You need to let stuff go and move on forward. You can't cling to them and, and be trapped in the past wondering, well, they haven't called me yet. Well, maybe tomorrow. Oh, I hope they call me next week. Oh, God, I want this. It's so easy to go there because we're naturally we want to be appreciated. So, mm -hmm. of hmm. course. Yeah, of by course. the way, I found an image of the character uh, from the show. Uh, it's actually a repaint of the main character, but like an evil version of him. 
yeah. uh yeah uh drago tyran and yeah it's it's a really cool honestly i love the designs of the characters on this show how like they have like like one colored skeleton and like the rest of the body is mm. like fleshed out in a different color it's kind of and and like it's an anime and cgi so it's kind of like so it's kind of like beast wars combined <laughs> with g1 but in present day it's really hard to describe to right. anyone who's never seen the show but but the one thing i do remember is bam bam it's a dino jam the dinosaurs <laughs> Music yeah. sticks, man. Music it sticks. Uh, it's catchier I than the just... One Piece theme song. <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, I still have I have theme songs left over from me growing up and watching cartoons. They're still stuck in my head. Yeah. Um, was it Deputy Dog? Yippee ki yo ki yay, galloping all the way, great big star on his chest. I mean, I mean that's stuck in my head. I can't believe it, and it'll always be there because I watched it so much when I was a kid. <laughs> Let's see. Um now continuing with Bleach. Um so yeah. course. Uh you are your character is the brother of one of the series main characters, Rukia. Um my question is, did you and Michelle Ruff, Rukia's voice actors, get to work uh, off each other on, on set or opposite or whether in the voice boot to build your iconic brother sister relationship in the show? Uh great question. And in general, uh, I don't think it's changed very often if if at all and and a few decades um you're almost always in the booth by yourself mm-hmm. and if you're fortunate enough mm-hmm. that the actor or actress that you're working opposite in a scene has already recorded their material you can hear mm-hmm. it in your headphones and, and play off of it but a lot of the time you're just going off of that's what they say next and this is what you know and that's where the director comes in to help give you a little context is why am i saying this or what is this in reference to or that kind of stuff so that so that it does make sense, even though you don't have the other person acting with you in the booth, or that you don't even have them in your headphones. So that's that's one of the critical things for the director to be able to do is to to answer those questions you might have. And you know, why am I? Why do I have such an attitude with her right now? What's going on? <laughs> and they hopefully know and can tell you. Um, so it's it's that it's that challenge that that you have to really be. Um, really diligent about looking at, at what the li- what the lyrics what the uh, the writing uh, is and um, and be able to interpret that and the longer you do a character the more you kind of get a sense of where they're headed or what they've done or, you know where they're at as a character uh, so that they would react to things in a, in a specific way based on what they're established as as that character uh, so yeah it's a, it's a great benefit to to have uh, to have it already in the headphones from somebody that's that's recorded it you know their role that's just a great thing to play off of and respond to because you know in acting you're reacting to what the other person's saying so that's just very helpful as opposed to just having to read what they're saying and then go okay they're probably going to say this this way so I'm going to do this mm-hmm. um, so that's that's the challenge therein uh, and it's so rare and so. It, it, it's equally rare as it is fun. They're both very true to be able to do something as a, as a group or to have a, a group read some video games like uh, one of the Robotech video games that we did. We <laughs> did it around around the table and uh, Richard F. Carr directed uh, and we just had a hell of a good time because we were able to act off each other. We could see right. and hear and it was just such a rush and anytime you have that opportunity it's just so much fun because you, you, you're naturally challenged to, to rise up to the best, your, the top of your ability because you have talented people around you that are bringing you there, that are forcing you. You can't suck. <laughs> it's like, no, I will not suck here. I will, <laughs> I will kick ass. Yeah, I was always, you know, I always found it very interesting uh, when, like in the instances where you do have each person record all of their lines one at a time because it always makes me wonder, what is it like being the first person to record? Because the second person can work off of the recordings of the first person. Right. The first person has no one to work off of. So how does that work? Well, again, it's it's very important that you you have a good director that yeah. that basically knows the backstory of what's going on with that episode and can fill you in on you know what that line means or how they mm-hmm. how they're going to be you know, responding to it logically. So that that really helps. That's it's critical that you have a good director that you can ask those questions, because that really uh, influences how you're going to portray the character or say the line. 
knowing what the circumstances are, how loud it's going to be, how big how, or how introverted it may be or, uh, you know, to yourself, all those different factors that, that play in there. Mm, that's interesting. interesting. Now, speaking of villains you've played, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, like th this show always like gets me very giddy. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, I can uh, see that. So, you know, we got characters like Liam Neeson playing Schindler and various characters uh, uh, written by Mel Brooks where we have a Nazi character, which we all know, World War II bad guys, but we have certain media where we have World War II bad guys who are very popular, like, or rather positively received by audience members. Now, you got to play the role of... Um, Rudolf von Stroheim in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure uh, uh, Battle Tendency. And he was not only just well received, but he got so many memes based <laughs> just off the one character. So, my question to you is what is your reaction to like the popularity of von Stroheim's character? I, one of the things that that was basically put out there initially by uh, I think Patrick Sykes uh, sites directed um, when we most of the ones that, that I worked on in that and um, it was just like over the top have fun go for it just you know that's that's what this guy is and it makes sense because you know becoming the cyborg and becoming this monster beyond what he already was but now just uh, just blowing up you know it's like arnold schwarzenegger on extra steroids and uh, and armor and uh, and a built-in gun in his arm and all this different stuff uh it, it allowed us to play and have fun especially with that character because he was just he was just you know one level in the sense but in the sense of you know everything has to be he is going to win no matter what. You tried to kill me and look, I'm back. Check this out. And and that the the meme that's that's probably one of the more popular ones, I think, and I'll probably paraphrase it and screw it up, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Was um, you know, just his response to to anybody challenging the the power or the the, the magnificence of, of the German uh, people and the German German engineering is the finest in the world. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I love bro rules. <laughs> so yeah, that, that yeah go ahead, just, go ahead. Just to have fun with that. I mean, yeah. just to be able to see, and you can see it's just it's so campy. I mean, it really is a, a campy character. I mean, he's serious in his own mind, but that's I mean, that's the way it is, and I think that's why it's gotten such a a, a good reaction because obviously, you know, playing a Nazi not exactly something I want to put on my resume necessarily, but in this case, because it's just so over the top, it's just silly and you can make fun of him and, and he's still very full of himself and he would never understand if you were making fun of him, he might, you know, shoot you, but um, it's, it's just, God, it's so much fun again. And, and because it's, it's silly in this case, it's just, yeah great great fun and and one of my you know just every once in a while you get to do characters like that and yeah. and it's just it's a, a radical departure from your norm and that's great yeah you know I, I i was this close to saying the phrase at least you played a fun nazi but then i realized <laughs> it, it, in yeah. helsing that the word fun nazi has a different meaning yeah <laughs> um yeah. But given the fact that he was like right there with Joseph, like right there in the final battle on that volcano, it does make me sad that he died in Stalingrad because you'd think, you know, being on the other end of the whole superior race thing, mm -hmm. you would have thought, yeah, maybe the whole Aryan thing isn't working out. So maybe I should join the Allied forces yeah. and use that German engineering for good. Exactly. <laughs> good luck on that. Yeah. Oh, yes. say hi, say hi to my great grandpa for me. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps no. on the Stalingrad, so <laughs> wow, on the Russian no. side, obviously. But mm -hmm. I'm figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> now going back to Japan, <laughs> yeah. so you also voice one of another anti-hero, and who's actually my also a historical anime. figure. Yes, well, one of the top animes of all time. Well, why one of my top five? Roni Kenshin. So you did voice Saito Hajime. Now again, same question with Bleach. What was your reaction knowing that this 
anti-hero of a character was also beloved by anime fans in the anime community. Like, heck, I saw, like, Anime Expo, like, two years ago, I saw a lot of cosplays mm-hmm. as Saito. So, again, same question. Um, What's your reaction yeah, of him being iconic? Just to go off for a second on the, on the cosplay thing, that's another thing that I, I think the first time I saw any cosplay, I, I think I could be off... Uh, that was one of my characters was one when, when I went to a comic con 10, 15 years ago or something and saw people walking around like, like Roy Foker. And <laughs> that was strange to me uh, to say the least. And, and then seeing some of the bleach uh, cosplayers and, and doing Biakuya, uh, it was, I was just like in awe because they go so full out on the costume and the look. And it's just, a lot of the times it's just amazing. Uh, the effort and the time that's put into it and and it's just and it's also so nice to know that they like the character that you put your voice to so much they want to dress up like that character and walk around and go check me out i'm a cool character so it's like yeah check me out me too um (laughs) as a little kid might say that um but um yeah i it's always amazing to me sometimes what what people will will really like about a character that you didn't necessarily think that that would be something that would stand out or that they would be appreciative of or that you know people would actually even talk about per se but to to be able to hit that the vibe of of being anti the norm and and being a little little on the outside and you're not sure you know where he might go where he or she as a character might go next because they're not doing what you expect them to do and that's Again, that's that's a pleasure to to find that that balance, that middle way, to to be able to to go a little skewed, but be able to bring it back to find maybe if there's some humanity because that's the thing. Even if you're a horrible vic, the villain, if you're the worst imaginable, there's got to be some sense because we carry both good and evil within us. There's got to be some sense of that good somewhere. There's something. And so that to, to, rather than just be a one dimensional character to find anything you can that that is hard to believe, but fascinating to see when somebody is so evil and then they're so kind to a dog that comes by or something. And they mm-hmm. just love this dog with their heart. And then they go kill 28 people uh, because they said, wrong, yeah, with a pencil, pencil yeah. and they said the wrong thing. <laughs> um, so. So, yeah, I. Um, Again, at, at times I'm just stunned and, and overwhelmed by a fan reaction that I just didn't see coming, and I didn't necessarily see that coming with with that character. But awesome! I'm just again, I'm so I'm so blessed, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, with all the things that I get to do. Also, the yeah. fact that he's based on a real character, real person, yeah, actually, very, yeah real person. Yeah, yeah, that's another okay. thing too. Is to pull, and if you can find anything out that might be suitable to bring out somehow, if you have someone based in fact, that's also just so. I mean, especially you see that in in portrayals on screen of of different characters that are real life people. It's like you try to find whatever you can that you can bring into that because that's part of them. And so, yeah, it's it's a, the actor's job to bring you know to bring as much as they can to each character. I think and and to be able to. To be willing to to research and look for those things because that brings out so much more for the for the fans and for the people watching it that that you've done your work that you've made you've made your full effort you know you've given it all you've got to to bring as much as you can to the character okay. yeah you know i um um you know like for a lot of people when they watch an anime for the first time not knowing what anime is they just think it's just another cartoon like 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 another american cartoon like like pokemon it's, it's <laughs> another american cartoon dragon ball z so their moon same thing but for me the very, very first anime i saw knowing it's an anime was roni kenshin because when i was in the fourth grade uh we had to do book reports every week and one week we had to do a historical event on a different country. And I did mine on the Meiji Restoration because I got Japan for my book report. And I just mm-hmm. loved that historical event so much that when I found – when someone told me that there's a cartoon based on that historical time period, I had to check it out. So I watched Roni Kenshin and I just fell in love with it. And I found, And when I found out that 
Saito Hajime is an actual character because, you know, the Shinsengumi were a real thing. I did. I mentioned in my book report, you know, I was just like enamored with the show. Like, I have to watch more of this. <laughs> so, like, mm. thank you for being a part of, like, my academic excellence <laughs> in the fourth grade. Yeah. I'm here to support your school. <laughs> so, Mike, you got to thank uh, Dan. He helped you get an A, right? You got an A in that paper, right? In the report? Yeah. That, oh, was so, yeah. the, that was the only, yeah. probably the only assignment in the fourth grade I got an A on. So you better think yeah. Dan. He's over here right now. Yeah. There it is, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dan, and everyone else in the American voice cast of Rurouni. Yeah, exactly. I'd like to thank the whole, the whole core of actors in the United States and elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Lex Lang. Thank you, the guy who did the voice of Joe Keto from Digimon. <laughs> thank you, the guy who did the voice of Ty from Digimon. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, speaking of Saban Properties, um, <laughs> this year is the 20th anniversary of Power Rangers Wild Force. And, of course, you were the first of two voice actors from uh, uh, who played um, uh, Zanaku. Yeah. And of course, the other voice actor was also in Ruoni Kenshin, just saying. <clears throat> uh, and yep. um, and you also <clears throat> played Onikage, who's another major villain of the show. So, like, what? So, how does it feel knowing that this character that you played on this live action kids show would be would still be so popular twenty years later? Like twenty years later, Senaku. I, I tell you, Senaku. I tell you. Um, I don't, I don't think in terms of, you know, I wonder if this will be still circulating out there in 20 years. Um, that'd be great. But I, I just don't, I, I, I try to bring what I can to each character and then go from there. And if it's a long run of something, then you think maybe it has a shot to, to last for some time. Um, but the, the bottom line to answer your question, it, it, it feels tremendous um, to have created something that, that still resonates, that people appreciate. It's just such, a, such an honor and, and such an opportunity to do that. The, the thing with, um, with the, the characters that we put the voices to in, in Power Rangers, you didn't know what you were going to do necessarily. I did, you know, we did Walla sessions, which... Um, for anybody that doesn't know, Walla is the background uh, talking, like let's say you're in a restaurant scene and you hear people talking in the background, but you can't quite make out what they're saying, but it just fills the, the ambiance of the scene and it's real. Mm -hmm. That's Walla and that's what you do. And the word came from uh, originally, people would actually just talk softly in the background saying, Walla, 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 Walla. Oh. And so that's where the term came from, in, in my understanding, unless I'm wrong, which is still possible, uh, probable in many ways. Um, but that's the derivation of the term. And so we would be hired, uh, there would be a few of us in there doing fight scenes and, and doing the Walla and different stuff like that. And you'd be assigned to a specific character. And in that case, that was a character given to me. And then you just kind of look at it and you go, well, what voice do I want to apply to this and play around for a minute and then find something. And Scott pegged her, um, oh, bless his heart. He passed away just recently. Um, yeah. Scott was our director and, and just uh, kept it all together. And, and it was awesome because, you know, he just go, yo, that, that's, that sounds good. Yeah. Do that, do that, that kind of a thing. And then, so that's that's what I did with with Zenaku, and we just we had a hell of a good time. Again, it was just so much fun uh, doing that, and yeah, that was uh, that was quite a bit of fun. And the studio was a nice sized studio, and we had a good time driving out there and doing it. And, and you know, it was kind of like a it was a half a day experience or so. It's like I'm going to go out there and drive out to. Uh, to up the road a little bit and go to this big beautiful studio and do this and then take a little ride back home and what a nice day um but it was it was always a good experience we just had fun and that's you, you just can't i mean half the time you just as an actor you you at least i do i just marvel that i'm being paid to do this stuff that i love so much it's like seriously you're gonna give me money too wow awesome thank you could i have a little <laughs> more going? please uh, going off of a story from a certain other Power Ranger voice actor, when you picked up the script to audition for Zanaku, were you aware that uh, he was going to be a recurring villain or were you under the impression that he was a one-off monster of the day? I think realistically, because I did a few different ones um, over that time, I didn't know 
you know, one would be more popular than another or whatever else. It was just given the opportunity to do it. And and Scott was great about that. He brought different people in, you know, on a regular basis. And so just to be a part of that was was, you know, just a, a treat. And so uh, whether it was going to be a long term or not, it didn't really know. And, and I don't I don't know that that Scott knew per se how far in advance in the episodes, you know, characters would be recurring or come back and, you know, whatever might be happening. But but it was just that was, again, the chance to be creative is to look at this costume, look at the actor in the costume and go, what voice would seem right for this monster? OK, let's try this and see. And, and that's just that's great fun. I just recorded uh, a couple different video games that, of course, I'm not supposed to talk about, so I won't give you any names. But um, in doing that, it, it was just, OK, this is what he looks like. When he went, in fact, in one of them, they, they submitted my demo reel and, and the producer went back to the casting people and said, well, he, he doesn't have anything that sounds like what we're thinking about for this character. Do you mind? Would he mind auditioning? I'm like, no, I'll audition. And, and I just looked at it and, and put what I thought would be right for that character vocally and, and you know next day I was like yeah okay you got it you're good but i had done one other boy i did like three takes because there was just a few lines and i did three takes on on each and the last one i did was was quite a bit different than than the first two it was kind of going against character but it was a fun voice and um the the engineer and the studio guy that owned the, that owned the studio said oh, i love that that's the best take but that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted this the, kind of a standard for what it was, but that's it. You you have to make a choice. You have to look look at the character and say, I think it'll sound like this. And um, you know, half the time, uh, that would be you know you making the decision without anyone there to give you any suggestions or input. And in this case, I I knew what they wanted because they I, I already knew what I did for the other audition. So I just you know did it again and basically uh enjoyed enjoyed the hell out of it again it's just god i i still i mean i marvel it's like you really i get to play some more i'm just i'm a little kid in an, in an older body if you will but i'm still a little kid so this is just yeah. wow i'm i'm just so grateful um and that will continue i i marvel at the fact that i get to do this for a living yeah i like to I, I like to call that stanley syndrome where like where like even if you're like a big hot shot nerd icon you're still like a kid at heart and you're just doing the thing you love as a kid yeah I, it's just like yeah let's do that oh that's so cool let's do that yeah 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 let's try that because i i mean i want to do that i and ideally you're in a situation where you can play on top of playing so that you can go, let's try let, You know what? I got a, a voice I want to do with this. See if it might work. What do you think? And then do that. And, and sometimes I go, yeah, love it. And that's just, wow. It's, yeah. it's being paid to be creative and have fun. Yeah. You know? yes. It's like re recess and we're going to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'll add anything, adding this to, um, I mean, yes, these are characters you did voice Dan, but a lot of these characters was our childhood. And we yeah. want to thank you for that, for giving us great memories. Oh, no. no, thank you, man. That's, yeah. I, that, that's, that's such a treasure to know that I've yeah. been part of creating something that other people really that took it to heart and that mm -hmm. they, they kind of grew up with it and enjoyed it and continue to. That's just like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, that's some little bit of a legacy there. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah I love it because, you know, like, you know, like Zanaku and Saito were part of my childhood uh Byakuya was part of my uh, adolescence and von stroheim and roy <laughs> foker are part of my adulthood and it's like it's like so it's like you're right there you're growing up with me you're part of my you're part of my biography <laughs> and i will continue to add to it as long as i can <laughs> Um, now dan there are some fan questions well some you know they want to say hi to you are you ready for your fans I'll see what I can do. Yeah. So let's see the comments. Zero is X Y says the football stare. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then he puts, "I love." Okay. <laughs> hey, <brother Roy. laughs> oh, Thank Jake. You. Jake Gonzalez says, "What color ranger? What color Power Ranger would you be?" Can you review a few of my options? 
as red, far as the power blue, ranger color black yellow red, yeah, I'm thinking, white I, silver I, yeah exactly that's uh, i didn't make sure i didn't miss something that wasn't stuck in the back of my head i i'm i like blue i mean the fact that you have my name up here or the blue background i'm like i'm i like blue is the shirt blue <laughs> it's blue oh my god um, i just know it's coincidentally too <laughs> yeah so that is that is me that's like favorite color blue um, and it's the color so, of Roy Foker's uniform. There and there is that. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So that would that would be my choice. Absolutely, <laughs> can't deny it. <laughs> if I got uh, to voice Zanaku, I I would jokingly say silver. Obviously, have you not seen Wild Force? <laughs> yeah. But no, like, but no, you have you have every right to pick blue as your favorite color. You know, because I you know. appreciate that. <laughs> I will take that. Um. So we have Rarik says Roy, Roy's death was one of the most saddest moments in that. Yeah, that is true. No, yeah, thanks, Eric. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I want to go a little piggyback in this question. Like yeah. when you did the voice for this during this scene, like what was the emotions going through through this through the death scene of Roy? Well, I think excuse me within the. Uh, Within the context of what you know, Roy was going through, it, it's like obviously I, as far as I remember, I haven't died yet in this lifetime, so I don't totally know what would be my last thoughts. But at the same time, I feel that that he, it, at that moment in time, was was looking over his life and and thinking about Claudia, thinking about um, any number of of people that that matter to him to rick to to his legacy to you know to the skies I, I i feel like trying to bring that all in and also recognizing that this is the last thing that he's going to say as a character there's there ain't gonna be much talking after this so to to really try to bring as much reality to that moment and and the sadness certainly was there for me knowing that the that the character would would no longer be talking that i would no longer be roy I would be a guy that was Roy, <laughs> and uh, so that was that was certainly I, I I can imagine that that I brought that in without even thinking about it. That was the natural, you know, within me was that that sense of loss, and and that's you know a lot about what that scene was was just a sense of loss, the loss of life, obviously, but but the loss of the people around him that he cared about, the loss of the things that he loved, and. Um, and also, no doubt, you know, war and and the loss and and the tragedy of war. So, and that's another thing about the show. Is that's another example of portraying things in a manner that are real that you never saw before in anime that in cartoons didn't exist. If I jumped off a twelve-story building, I would bounce and roll and go on to the next thing. And so, to portray someone actually being in a battle and dying from it was huge and and devastating. Because I know nobody watching it expected it to happen, and I yeah, and the way it. and the way it was um, and the way it was shown, yeah. it's like he didn't even realize right away that he sustained fatal injuries until right, after exactly. he came home to Claudia and he just simply asked, "May I have a pineapple salad?" Yeah, and and that's you know him, I think, and probably just just trying to let her down and not know you know don't don't come in and make it worse on her just to you know i'm not doing great here but pineapple salad will help hon thank you i really really appreciate it. you know i i feel like that was that was his kind of a gift to her in some ways as far as not you know not showing her how hurt he was or that's how he felt about it was just to you know everything's going to be okay mm, it's not but i want to appear like it is because i don't want to hurt you even more yeah. So hmm. I think that was part of it. Um, you know, but it's yeah, kinda like the, it's kind of like the Black Ranger from uh, from Jetman because uh, oh, yeah. he was going because he was going to the wedding of the Red and White Rangers, and because they the three of them had a love triangle, but he accepted defeat. And like a year later, he was going to their wedding, and he tried to stop a mugger, and he got stabbed on the way to the wedding. And like and like the entire wedding reception, he's like pretending like he's totally okay. I'm just gonna sit here on this bench. Don't worry about me. Let's take yeah. some photos. But then like he tried to make it look like he just fell asleep when he died, and no one even realized that he died until like after the wedding was over. <laughs> so, so like it kind of yeah. gave me Jetman vibes, which works because you're because you play an aviator. <laughs> yeah, there it is. 
Um, Eric Williams again. Best fan inter- Oh, I think he's asking like, uh, was there any um, memorable fan interaction that maybe a big by Bayaki a cosplayer at a maybe a well, yeah, that, convention? that would be where I go on that. It's just uh, there's there's been a, a couple different people that have come by when I was at a table that's signing stuff that that had dressed up that had done cosplay as as Byakuya. and I, I'm just I'm stunned and 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 so you know, blown away honestly uh, mm-hmm. by the the effort put into it and and how amazing you know the creativity of the of the fan base uh, is just it's stunning and so. I, I'm so it, it's it touches me that 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 character resonates so much with them that they they want to do that and then the the level of the creativity in doing so is just like wow I I mean I can't draw I, the last time I I made clothing was in a class in college that I had to make a shirt because it was a costuming class that I had to take and. I wish I still had that shirt to show people how bad it was. It was so poorly sewn. It was so bad. And so anybody that can design clothing and then and then make it fit beautifully on them and and wow, I have great great appreciation for that. There's so many things I am untalented at, and that's certainly one of them. Mm-hmm. Speaking right, of yeah. life, speaking of life skills uh, and bleach, you know one of my favorite things about the uh, Arankar arc is how you got Renji, uh, Yurichika, Ikaku, and Rangiku, like trying to like under oh, and uh, Toshiro, like trying to like understand human culture, like in the living world. And sometimes I wonder, I wonder what would be like if uh, Byakuya tried to adapt to human society because he's such a stick in the mud. I want to see yeah. how he tries to survive there. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, just the, the episode where he tried to tell jokes um, that he was trying to be funny. That was so much fun because it's just so against anything he'd normally do and his personality doesn't know how to do it doesn't have a clue and that's that's so much fun again just trying to trying to be funny and and in a in a body or in a in a character that's just not and uh and being able to portray that is also just great great fun for me mm-hmm. wonderful um so we'll do this last actually <laughs> not a question but it's actually a kind of requ- request dan Mm-mm. Can you give an impression of Ray Falker? Scenario: You forgot to pay the water bill. Hmm. 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 So, scenario: Ray mm-hmm. forgot to pay. Let's say the electric bill. Oh yeah, the electric water bill, and his partner gets mad. Mm-hmm. Claudia gets mad. Yeah. So, yeah. That's scenario. Yeah, because apparently you do have to pay the DWP on a um, Macross station. <laughs> apparently um well perhaps um so this is what you're talking about the the water bill uh no i i thought you were gonna i thought you were gonna take care of that claudia i i you know i've been flying this whole week has been a very busy mission and it's it's, it's a water bill and i know you've been busy i know you get busy and i know we don't spend enough time together, but we're going <laughs> to. So I, I, I honestly thought that, that you were going to take care of this, but but I'll take care of it tomorrow. Meanwhile, maybe a pineapple salad to make it a little better. What do you think? There we go, guys. guys. Ray, we had Dan doing Ray. Yeah. I, look, I, I'm, I'm just going to blame this on Lisa for not sending everyone the memo. <laughs> You know, she's probably too distracted by Min May's uh, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, guys. So, again, thank you so much for being part of a special podcast interview with a buddy show with anime voice legend Dan Warren. Dan, thank you so much thank for being a special guest. Um, kind and I appreciate it. So, be- Dan, before we leave, where can he find you in social media oh, you- or anything where they can follow you? Um, I-, I will probably start utilizing... Um, instagram a little bit in the near future i haven't much at all um mm-hmm. but uh i have something that i'm i'm just embarking on i i shot a lot of pictures over the years and and in the last uh, 10 years or so a lot of stuff on my phone that that has turned out pretty well and so i'm just getting into the process of, of uh, maybe making some prints and and possibly selling some prints um 
that I've just gotten a lot of people that have said really nice things about it. And, and uh, so that may be something that ends up on Streamily at some point as well. Um, there's, there's some stuff coming up on, on Streamily. Uh, I think we're doing a, a, a bleach uh, thing, uh, signing on there in, in August, I believe. Um, and uh, so the, the photograph thing is, is something I'm really interested in. So I may put out a few pictures just to kind of uh, put them out there to get a sense. But they're, they're on a lot of different topics and things that I, that I, I just get excited about shooting because I, I walk a lot. And so sometimes I'm just looking around. The walk is an excuse to take some pictures, I guess, realistically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. Um, yeah, that I'm not real active on Facebook. I, I mean, I'm not real active social media wise. I may be slowly and I stress the word slowly uh, turning in a direction to be much more active with that uh, because I'm doing more autograph signings, uh, convention things uh, as, they're, as they're coming up. There's more stuff happening. So I'm getting more involved with it. So um i just got a lot of uh, in audio books as well for anybody that did, if you're at all interested in any audio books i've uh, recorded um the if you go to audible there's over 175 or so different titles you can listen to samples of if there's something that might interest you and in the future hopefully not too far um i'm going to start recording in july the uh, the ultimate history of video games and oh. that was uh initially done close to 10 years ago, but then they decided that they would add to what all has happened since then. And so mm -hmm. this, the first book, they actually do two volumes and significantly uh, large. Uh, the first volume is about 22 hours of listening time. Volume two is also 21 or 22 hours of listening time. So I start recording that in July, but it's fascinating stuff just from the beginning of the arcade and and you know people involved with it at the very very beginning of it to to the present basically so that that could be something if you're a video game um aficionado that might be a really cool thing to listen to uh, and i promise not to suck i'm saying it right here i will do i will do a really good job because i care about it too um but that that should be quite a bit of fun to listen to uh, and I don't make any extra money if I sell more. So it's not about me getting money from you guys to go buy my books. No. Yep. Yep. I got audio, uh, audible right here and I yep. to have eight credits saved up. <laughs> so that's like eight Dan Warren narrated novels. I could get right now for free. You are so lucky. Uh, <laughs> Actually, actually, can I ask you a quick question about Audible? What is the yeah. process for like recording audiobooks in general? Because like I know it's like because I know some audiobooks are like nine hours long, some are twenty three hours long. Like, like what is the process for like recording so many hours of just text and text? And text? Yeah, generally you're working a kind of a a nine to five shift more or less in the recording of it. Um, but it varies. Again, there's a lot of room to sometimes you record at night, sometimes you record in the morning. And because of uh, COVID, basically the, the influx of home studios where a lot of people are recording in their own home studio because they couldn't go to a studio because nobody wanted to interact, you know, face to face. Um, so, so that's really skyrocketed since 2020. Um, and then also you, you still in the studio. That's, that's the general thing. Like I just finished a pro a project uh, a couple days ago and in doing that, <clears throat> excuse me, too much soda here. Um, the, uh, the fact that, uh, you're in the studio, you start around nine, nine thirty, something like that. And then you'll take a break for lunch, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour and then go back. So you're recording about five, five to six hours a day. And depending on the length of the book, that may be many days in a row. Like for this stuff that I was just talking about in July, that will, I'll be working all of July realistically, because that's a lot of recording time. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and it takes it out of you. You wouldn't think, but there's a lot, a lot more to it than just, you know, talking you, you're in a black booth, basically most of the time you're doing it, you're in the dark with a little light on and maybe you have an engineer or maybe you're recording it yourself. Maybe you have a director. Maybe you have an engineer and a director. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many different ways it can be done, but um, you, you really have to learn to, it, it's a muscle because in the beginning I could never record that long because it just took so much out of my voice and you, you can't lose your voice or you know, you're know you screwed. Um, 
honestly, the very first job that I got uh, narrating a major book, my vo- I got sick about a week into it and had to stop for about five or six days. And I thought I was going to be fired. I was so stressed. I was like, no, no, I just got the job. No. <laughs> and they were cool about it. And it turned out well. Yeah. Um, but that's it. You really have to be aware of, of uh, taking care of yourself uh, vocally, physically, mm-hmm. emotionally, all that, because it's draining. It, you, you wouldn't think so, but talk all day. It, it uh, takes it out of you. Yeah. So if that answers yeah. your question a little bit, I can tell you more anytime, but awesome. that's, awesome. that's overall. And for those of you interested, some of the titles that he did the voice work for include The Billionaire's Apprentice, First Casualty, Pe- uh, Pieces Every Breath, uh, The Bone Thief, First Shots, Silence, and many others. So be sure to check those out on uh, Audible. Yeah, there's a lot of nonfiction and there's some cool fiction in there too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely interested in checking out the art of communication because you know I definitely want to improve my personal communication skills. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> I I really I mean that's the thing I, I continue to learn, and the fact that I continue to learn is what I'm learning, mm-hmm. and that's awesome. That that you know you, you get to a point in your life perhaps that you're like all right I know this, I, mm-hmm. yeah. but I, I'm not going to find that point because by reading a lot of nonfiction, I'm learning stuff on a regular basis that I might not normally pick up or learn about, but also the fact that I can continue to learn things that that I should, that I should continue, not just, okay, graduated. I don't have to learn anymore. Uh -uh. Uh, It's it's such an opportunity. And the more you're able to do and learn about, the more you're able to interact and and, uh, hang out. Yeah, if I could relegate all my interests uh, into one word, it's learning. Like, I like to learn new things. One of my favorite things uh, I enjoyed learning in the last four years is how to solve a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes. Um, He's yeah it was you. a pleasure yeah. uh, meeting you, getting to talk to you, getting to dissect your history and mm-hmm. amazing artistry today. <laughs> And I can't wait that, to see you again real amazing? soon in person. Again. Not fantastically amazing? Come on. Fantastically. <laughs> fantabulous. <laughs> fantabulous. <laughs> I'll take it. Thanks. Um, really so before it. before we leave, uh, we did Dan. Uh, Mike, where can they find you in social media? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, Boken underscore Kabuto. And you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Boken Kabuto, where I will be uh, playing uh, Sonic Heroes and Jedi Fallen Order. <laughs> Uh, you can find me on Instagram, dancerboy247. And also, if you like Power Rangers, please follow the Morphin Network. Yeah. Um, really? Yes. All right, Dan, thank you so much for spending this awesome mon- uh, Monday with us. It Monday is. afternoon. It is. Too- it's Monday. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's a good Monday. It's yeah, a Monday it that is. didn't suck. So yeah, I think this I has agree. been the best Monday in months. <laughs> yes. I would say. Awesome. All right. I'm so glad to be a part of it. Yes. All right, guys. Uh, for viewers, thank you for watching. And Dan, thank yeah, you thank you so to much. everybody that's that's tuned in. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. And, yes. uh, have a wonderful week. Yes. Again, guys, Hope this is more. Fun. I mean, yes. okay. Again, thank you, Dan. Me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dan. Nice, uh, again, guys, this is Barry Show, and we're signing off. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Bye now. <laughs>